Section 6 of Crime and Punishment. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 1, Chapter 6. Later on, Raskolnikov happened to find out why the huckster and his wife had invited Lizavieta. It was a very ordinary matter, and there was nothing exceptional about it. A family who had come to town and been reduced to poverty were selling their household goods and clothes, all women's things. As the things would have fetched little in the market, they were looking for a dealer. This was Lizavieta's business. She undertook such jobs and was frequently employed, as she was very honest and always fixed a fair price and stuck to it. She spoke, as a rule, little, and, as we have said already, she was very submissive and timid. But Raskolnikov had become superstitious of late. The traces of superstition remained in him long after, and were almost ineradicable. And in all this he was always afterwards disposed to see something strange and mysterious, as it were, the presence of some peculiar influences and coincidences. In the previous winter a student he knew called Pokorev, who had left for Kharkov, had chanced in conversation to give him the address of Alyona Ivanovna, the old pawnbroker, in case he might want to pawn anything. For a long while he did not go to her, for he had lessons and managed to get along somehow. Six weeks ago he had remembered the address. He had two articles that could be pawned, his father's old silver watch and a little gold ring with three red stones, a present from his sister at parting. He decided to take the ring. When he found the old woman, he had felt an insurmountable repulsion for her at the first glance, though he knew nothing special about her. He got two roubles from her and went into a miserable little tavern on his way home. He asked for tea, sat down, and sank into deep thought. A strange idea was pecking at his brain like a chicken in the egg, and very, very much absorbed him. Almost beside him at the next table there was sitting a student, whom he did not know and had never seen, and with him a young officer. They had played a game of billiards and began drinking tea. All at once he heard the student mention to the officer, the pawnbroker Elyana Ivanovna, and give him her address. This of itself seemed strange to Raskolnikov. He had just come from her, and here at once he heard her name. Of course it was a chance, but he could not shake off a very extraordinary impression, and here someone seemed to be speaking expressly for him. The student began telling his friend various details about Elyana Ivanovna. "'She is first-rate,' he said. "'You can always get money from her. She is as rich as a Jew. She can give you five thousand roubles at a time, and she is not above taking a pledge for a rouble. Lots of our fellows have had dealings with her, but she is an awful old harpy.' And he began describing how spiteful and uncertain she was, how if you were only a day late with your interest the pledge was lost, how she gave a quarter of the value of an article, and took five and even seven per cent a month on it, and so on. The student chattered on, saying that she had a sister, Lizavieta, whom the wretched little creature was continually beating, and kept in complete bondage like a small child, though Lizavieta was at least six feet high. "'There's a phenomenon for you,' cried the student, and he laughed. They began talking about Lizavieta. The student spoke about her with a peculiar relish and was continually laughing, and the officer listened with great interest and asked him to send Lizavieta to do some mending for him. Raskolnikov did not miss a word and learned everything about her. Lizavieta was younger than the old woman, and she was her half-sister, being the child of a different mother. She was thirty-five. She worked day and night for her sister, and besides doing the cooking and the washing, she did sewing and worked as a charwoman and gave her sister all she earned. She did not dare to accept an order or job of any kind without her sister's permission. The old woman had already made her will, and Lizaveta knew of it, and by this will she would not get a farthing, nothing but the movables, chairs, and so on. All the money was left to a monastery in the province of N, that prayers might be said for her in perpetuity. Lizaveta was of lower rank than her sister, unmarried and awfully uncouth in appearance, remarkably tall with long feet that looked as if they were bent outwards. She always wore battered goatskin shoes, and was clean in her person. What the student expressed most surprise and amusement about was the fact that Lizavieta was continually with child. "'But you say she is hideous?' observed the officer. "'Yes, she is so dark-skinned and looks like a soldier dressed up, but you know she is not at all hideous. She has such a good-natured face and eyes, strikingly so. And the proof of it is that lots of people are attracted by her. She is such a soft, gentle creature.' ready to put up with anything, always willing, willing to do anything. And her smile is really very sweet. You seem to find her attractive yourself, laughed the officer. From her queerness. No, I'll tell you what. 
I could kill that damned old woman and make off with her money, I assure you, without a faintest conscience, prick. The student added with warmth. The officer laughed again while Raskolnikov shuddered. How strange it was. Listen, I want to ask you a serious question. The student said hotly. I was joking, of course, but look here. On one side we have a stupid, senseless, worthless, spiteful, ailing, horrid old woman. Not simply useless, but doing actual mischief. Who has not an idea what she is living for herself, and who will die in a day or two in any case. You understand? You understand? Yes, yes. I understand, answered the officer, watching his excited companion attentively. Well, listen, then. On the other side, fresh young lives thrown away for want of help and by thousands on every side. A hundred thousand good deeds could be done and helped on that old woman's money which will be buried in a monastery. Hundreds, thousands perhaps, might be set on the right path. Dozens of families saved from destitution, from ruin, from vice in the locked hospitals, and with all her money. Kill her, take her money, and with the help of it devote oneself to the service of humanity and the good of all. What do you think? Would not one tiny crime be wiped out by thousands of good deeds? For one life, thousands would be saved from corruption and decay. One death and a hundred lives in exchange. It's simple arithmetic. Besides, what value has the life of that sickly, stupid, ill-natured old woman in the balance of existence? No more than the life of a louse, of a black beetle. Less, in fact, because the old woman is doing harm. She is wearing out the lives of others. The other day she bit Lizaveta's finger out of spite. It almost had to be amputated. Of course, she does not deserve to live, remarked the officer. But there it is. It's nature. Oh, well, brother, but we have to correct and direct nature, and, but for that, we should drown in an ocean with prejudice. But for that, there would never have been a single great man. They talk of duty, conscience. I don't want to say anything against duty and conscience, but the point is, what do we mean by them? Stay, I have another question to ask you. Listen. No, you stay. I'll ask you a question. Listen. Well? You are talking and speechifying away. But tell me, would you kill the old woman yourself? Of course not. I was only arguing the justice of it. It's nothing to do with me. But I think if you would not do it yourself, there's no justice about it. Let us have another game. Raskolnikov was violently agitated. Of course it was all ordinary youthful talk and thought, such as he had often heard before in different forms on different themes. But why had he happened to hear such a discussion and such ideas at the very moment when his own brain was just conceiving the very same ideas? And why, just at the moment when he had brought away the embryo of his idea from the old woman, had he dropped at once upon a conversation about her? This coincidence always seemed strange to him. This trivial talk in a tavern had an immense influence on him in his later action, as though there really had been in it something preordained, some guiding hint. On returning from the haymarket, he flung himself on the sofa and sat for a whole hour without stirring. Meanwhile, it got dark. He had no candle, and indeed it did not occur to him to light up. He could never recollect whether he had been thinking about anything at that time. At last he was conscious of his former fever and shivering, and he realized with relief that he could lie down on the sofa. Soon heavy, leaden sleep came over him, as it were crushing him. He slept an extraordinarily long time and without dreaming. Nastasia, coming into his room at ten o'clock the next morning, had difficulty in rousing him. She brought him in tea and bread. The tea was again the second brew, and again in her own teapot. My goodness, how he sleeps! She cried indignantly. And he's always asleep. He got up with an effort. His head ached. He stood up, took a turn in his garret, and sank back on the sofa again. <laughs> Going to sleep again, cried Nastasia. Are you ill, huh? He made no reply. Do you want some tea? Afterwards, he said with an effort, closing his eyes again and turning to the wall. Nastasia stood over him. Perhaps he really is ill, she said, turned and went out. She came in again at two o'clock with soup. He was lying as before. The tea stood untouched. Nastasia felt positively offended and began wrathfully rousing him. Why are you lying like a log? She shouted, looking at him with repulsion. He got up and sat down again but said nothing and stared at the floor. "'Are you ill or not?' asked Nastasia, and again received no answer. "'You'd better go out and get a breath of air,' she said after a pause. "'Will you eat it or not?' "'Afterwards,' 
he said weakly. You can go. And he motioned her out. She remained a little longer, looked at him with compassion, and went out. A few minutes afterwards he raised his eyes and looked for a long while at the tea and the soup. Then he took the bread, took up a spoon, and began to eat. He ate a little, three or four spoonfuls, without appetite, as it were mechanically. His head ached less. After his meal he stretched himself on the sofa again, but now he could not sleep. He lay without stirring with his face in the pillow. He was haunted by daydreams, and such strange daydreams. In one that kept recurring, he fancied that he was in Africa, in Egypt, in some sort of oasis. The caravan was resting, the camels were peacefully lying down, the palms stood all around in a complete circle, all the party were at dinner. But he was drinking water from a spring which flowed gurgling close by. And it was so cool, it was wonderful, wonderful, blue cold water running among the party-colored stones and over the clean sand which glistened here and there like gold. Suddenly he heard a clock strike. He started, roused himself, raised his head, looked out of the window, and seeing how late it was, suddenly jumped up wide awake as though someone had pulled him off the sofa. He crept on tiptoe to the door, stealthily opened it, and began listening on the staircase. His heart beat terribly. But all was quiet on the stairs as if everyone was asleep. It seemed to him strange and monstrous that he could have slept in such forgetfulness from the previous day, and had done nothing, had prepared nothing yet, and meanwhile perhaps it had struck six, and his drowsiness and stupefaction were followed by an extraordinary, feverish, as it were distracted, haste. But the preparations to be made were few. He concentrated all his energies on thinking of everything and forgetting nothing, and his heart kept beating and thumping so that he could hardly breathe. First he had to make a noose and sew it into his overcoat. A work of a moment. He rummaged under his pillow and picked out amongst the linen stuffed away under it a worn-out, old, unwashed shirt. From its rags he tore a long strip, a couple of inches wide and about sixteen inches long. He folded this strip in two, took off his wide, strong summer overcoat of some stout cotton material, his only outer garment, and began sewing the two ends of the rag on the inside, under the left armhole. His hand shook as he sewed, but he did it successfully so that nothing showed outside when he put the coat on again. The needle and thread he had got ready long before, and they lay on his table in a piece of paper. As for the noose, it was a very ingenious device of his own. The noose was intended for the axe. It was impossible for him to carry the axe through the street in his hands. And if hidden under his coat, he would still have had to support it with his hand, which would have been noticeable. Now he had only to put the head of the axe in the noose, and it would hang quietly under his arm on the inside. Putting his hand in his coat pocket, he could hold the end of the handle all the way so that it did not swing. And as the coat was very full, a regular sack, in fact, it could not be seen from outside that he was holding something with the hand that was in the pocket. This noose, too, he had designed a fortnight before. When he had finished with this, he thrust his hand into a little opening between his sofa and the floor, fumbled in the left corner, and drew out the pledge, which he had got ready long before and hidden there. This pledge was, however, only a smooth, plain piece of wood the size and thickness of a silver cigarette case. He picked up this piece of wood in one of his wanderings in a courtyard where there was some sort of workshop. Afterwards he had added to the wood a thin, smooth piece of iron, which he had also picked up at the same time in the street. Putting the iron, which was a little the smaller, on the piece of wood, he fastened them very firmly, crossing and recrossing the thread around them, then wrapped them carefully and daintily in clean white paper, and tied the parcel so that it would be very difficult to untie it. This was in order to divert the attention of the old woman for a time, while she was trying to undo the knot, and so to gain a moment. The iron strip was added to give weight, so that the woman might not guess the first minute that the thing was made of wood. All this had been stored by him beforehand under the sofa. He had only just got the pledge out when he heard someone suddenly about in the yard. It struck six long ago. Long ago, my God. He rushed to the door, listened, caught up his hat, and began to descend his thirteen steps cautiously, noiselessly, like a cat. He had still the most important thing to do, to steal the axe from the kitchen. That the deed must be done with an axe he had decided long ago. He had also a pocket pruning knife, but he could not rely on the knife, and still less on his own strength, and so resolved finally on the axe. We may note in passing one peculiarity in regard to all the final resolutions taken by him in the matter. They had one strange characteristic. The more final they were, the more hideous and the more absurd they at once became in his eyes. In spite of all his agonizing inward struggle, he never, for a single instant all that time, could believe in the carrying out of his plans. 
and indeed if it had ever happened that everything to the least point could have been considered and finally settled, and no uncertainty of any kind had remained, he would, it seems, have renounced it all as something absurd, monstrous, and impossible. But a whole mass of unsettled points and uncertainties remained. As for getting the axe, that trifling business cost him no anxiety, for nothing could be easier. Nastasia was continually out of the house, especially in the evenings. She would run into the neighbors or to a shop, and always left the door ajar. It was the one thing the landlady was always scolding her about, and so, when the time came, he would only have to go quietly into the kitchen and to take the axe, and an hour later, when everything was over, go in and put it back again. But these were doubtful points. Supposing he returned an hour later to put it back, and Nastasia had come back and was on the spot, he would, of course, have to go by and wait till she went out again. But supposing she were in the meantime to miss the axe, look for it, make an outcry, that would mean suspicion, or at least grounds for suspicion. But those were all trifles which he had not even begun to consider, and indeed he had no time. He was thinking of the chief point, and put off trifling details until he could believe in it all. But that seemed utterly unattainable. So it seemed to himself, at least. He could not imagine, for instance, that he would sometime leave off thinking, get up, and simply go there. Even his late experiment, i.e. his visit with the object of a final survey of the place, was simply an attempt at an experiment, far from being the real thing, as though one should say, come, let us go and try it, why dream about it? And at once he had broken down and run away cursing, in a frenzy with himself. Meanwhile it would seem, as regards the moral question, that his analysis was complete. His casuistry had become keen as a razor, and he could not find rational objections in himself. But in the last resort he simply ceased to believe in himself, and doggedly, slavishly sought arguments in all directions, fumbling for them, as though someone were forcing and drawing him to it. At first, long before, indeed, he had been much occupied with one question. Why almost all crimes are so badly concealed and so easily detected, and why almost all criminals leave such obvious traces? He had come gradually to many different and curious conclusions, and in his opinion the chief reason lay not so much in the material impossibility of concealing the crime as in the criminal himself. Almost every criminal is subject to a failure of will and reasoning power by a childish and phenomenal heedlessness, at the very moment when prudence and caution are most essential. It was his conviction that this eclipse of reason and failure of will power attacked a man like a disease, developed gradually and reached its highest point just before the perpetration of the crime, continued with equal violence at the moment of the crime, and for longer or shorter time after, according to the individual case, and then passed off like any other disease. The question whether the disease gives rise to the crime, or whether the crime from its own peculiar nature is always accompanied by something of the nature of the disease, he did not yet feel able to decide. When he reached these conclusions, he decided that in his own case there could not be such a morbid reaction, that his reason and will would remain unimpaired at the time of carrying out his design, for the simple reason that his design was not a crime. We will omit all the process by means of which he arrived at this last conclusion. We have run too far ahead already. We may add only that the practical, purely material difficulties of the affair occupied a secondary position in his mind. One has but to keep all one's willpower and reason to deal with them, and they will all be overcome at the time when once one has familiarized oneself with the minutest details of the business. But this preparation had never been begun. His final decisions were what he came to trust least, and when the hour struck, it all came to pass quite differently, as it were accidentally and unexpected. One trifling circumstance upset his calculations, before he had even left the staircase. When he reached the landlady's kitchen, the door of which was open as usual, he glanced cautiously in to see whether, in Nastasia's absence, the landlady herself was there, or if not, whether the door to her own room was closed, so that she might not peep out when he went in for the axe. But what was his amazement when he suddenly saw that Nastasia was not only at home in the kitchen, but was occupied there, taking linen out of a basket and hanging it on a line. Seeing him, she left off hanging the clothes, turned to him, and stared at him all the time he was passing. He turned away his eyes, and walked past as though he noticed nothing. But it was the end of everything. He had not the axe. He was overwhelmed. What made me think? He reflected as he went under the gateway. What made me think that she would be sure not to be home at that moment? Why? Why did I assume this so certainly? He was crushed and even humiliated. He could have laughed at himself in his anger. A dull animal rage boiled within him. He stood hesitating at the gateway. To go into the street, to go a walk for appearance's sake, was revolting. 
to go back to his room even more revolting. And what a chance I have lost forever, he muttered, standing aimlessly in the gateway, just opposite the porter's little dark room, which was also open. Suddenly he started. From the porter's room, two paces away from him, something shining under the bench to the right caught his eye. He looked about him. Nobody. He approached the room on tiptoe, went down two steps into it, and in a faint voice called the porter. Yes, not at home. Somewhere near, though, in the yard. The door is wide open. He dashed to the axe, it was an axe, and pulled it out from under the bench, where it lay between two chunks of wood. At once, before going out, he made it fast in the noose. He thrust both hands into his pockets and went out of the room. No one had noticed him. When reason fails, the devil helps, he thought with a strange grin. The chance raised his spirits extraordinarily. He walked along quietly and sedately, without hurry, to avoid awakening suspicion. He scarcely looked at the passers-by, tried to escape looking at their faces at all, and to be as little noticeable as possible. Suddenly he thought of his hat. Good heavens, I had the money the day before yesterday and did not get a cap to wear instead. A curse rose from the bottom of his soul. Glancing out of the corner of his eye into a shop, he saw by a clock on the wall that it was ten minutes past seven. He had to make haste, and at the same time to go some way round, so as to approach the house from the other side. When he had happened to imagine all this beforehand, he had sometimes thought that he would be very much afraid. But he was not very much afraid now, was not afraid at all indeed. His mind was even occupied by irrelevant matters, but by nothing for long. As he passed the Usupov garden, he was deeply absorbed in considering the building of great fountains, and of their refreshing effect on the atmosphere in all the squares. By degrees he passed to the conviction that if the summer garden were extended to the field of Mars, and perhaps joined to the garden of Mihailovsky Palace, it would be a splendid thing and a great benefit to the town. Then he was interested by the question why in all great towns men are not simply driven by necessity, but in some peculiar way inclined to live in those parts of the town where there are no gardens nor fountains, where there is most dirt and smell and all sorts of nastiness. Then his own walks through the haymarket came back to his mind, and for a moment he waked up to reality. What nonsense! He thought. Better think of nothing at all. So, probably men led to execution clutch mentally at every object that meets them on the way. Flashed through his mind, but simply flashed like lightning. He made haste to dismiss this thought, and by now he was near. Here was the house. Here was the gate. Suddenly a clock somewhere struck once. What? Can it be half-past seven? Impossible! It must be fast. Luckily for him, everything went well again at the gates. At that very moment, as though expressly for his benefit, a huge wagon of hay had just driven in at the gate, completely screening him as he passed under the gateway, and the wagon had scarcely had time to drive through into the yard before he had slipped in a flash to the right. On the other side of the wagon he could hear shouting and quarreling, but no one noticed him, and no one met him. Many windows looking into that huge quadrangular yard were open at that moment, but he did not raise his head, he had not the strength to. The staircase leading to the old woman's room was close by, just on the right of the gateway. He was already on the stairs. Drawing a breath, pressing his hand against his throbbing heart, and once more feeling for the axe and setting it straight, he began softly and cautiously ascending the stairs, listening every minute. But the stairs, too, were quite deserted. All the doors were shut. He met no one. One flat, indeed, on the first floor was wide open, and painters were at work in it, but they did not glance at him. He stood still, thought a moment, and went on. Of course, it would be better if they had not been here, but it's two stories above them. And there was the fourth story. Here was the door. Here was the flat opposite, the empty one. The flat underneath the old woman's was apparently empty also. The visiting card nailed on the door had been torn off. They had gone away. He was out of breath. For one instant the thought floated through his mind. Shall I go back? But he made no answer and began listening at the old woman's door. A dead silence. Then he listened again on the staircase, listened long and intently, then looked about him for the last time, pulled himself together, drew himself up, and once more tried the axe in the noose. Am I very pale? He wondered. Am I not evidently agitated? She is mistrustful. Had I better wait a little longer till my heart leaves off thumping? But his heart did not leave off. On the contrary, as though to spite him, it throbbed more and more violently. He could stand it no longer. He slowly put out his hand to the bell and rang. 
Half a minute later he rang again, more loudly. No answer. To go on ringing was useless and out of place. The old woman was, of course, at home, but she was suspicious and alone. He had some knowledge of her habits, and once more he put his ear to the door. Either his senses were peculiarly keen, which it is difficult to suppose, or the sound was really very distinct. Anyway, he suddenly heard something like the cautious touch of a hand on the lock, and the rustle of a skirt at the very door. Someone was standing stealthily close to the lock, and just as he was doing on the outside, was secretly listening within, and seemed to have her ear to the door. He moved a little on purpose, and muttered something aloud, that he might not have the appearance of hiding, then rang a third time, but quietly, soberly, and without impatience. Recalling it afterwards, that moment stood out in his mind vividly, distinctly, forever. He could not make out how he had had such cunning, for his mind was as it were clouded at moments, and he was almost unconscious of his body. An instant later he heard the latch unfastened. End of Part 1, Chapter 6